what Michael just called the bureaucracy, the sort of political bureaucracy, the kind of permanent bureaucracy of Washington that also exists in the states, Donald Trump and Steve Bannon and his folk have labeled that the deep state. And when they say the deep state, that's what they mean. They mean the bureaucratic, regular $40,000 to $50,000 an hour working folks who actually maintain government. And what they understand is that what stopped Donald Trump from doing his worst is that everything he did had to grind through the sort of slowing mechanisms of bureaucracy. So it's not efficient. Politics is not efficient. That's why people are mad at Joe Biden. He can't get things done because you have this bureaucracy, you have the Senate, they've got a, you know, ability to filibuster. All of that slow motion stuff slows down extreme policy. Trump gets back in, he gets rid of all those people. And then he says, we're not having an election. Uh, I'm staying. Well, who's going to stop him, boo? Who's going to check him? If the local bureaucrats don't do it, that's who stopped him from doing the coup the first time. Your thoughts? Well, I mean, I'm glad Michael's here because this is such, I mean, I actually think this is a great moment because it provides clarity to the fact that our democracy is and has always been fragile in nature. It is very mm -hmm. dependent. Right. It's not just dependent on the structure of the Constitution. It's dependent on good people holding office and good people serving that actually have loyalty to the Constitution. And I think what Donald Trump, if you asked him what his biggest regret was, his biggest regret was putting certain people in certain positions that ended up not that. doing what he wanted. If you th Absolutely. think about this, if there was a different Secretary of Defense at the time That's of, right. at the end of 2020, what the result would have been. If there was a different vice president, what the result would have been. If there was a different FBI de director, what would the result have been? All three of which of those people, Donald Trump has gone out of his way in the last year That's right. just to rip on in the course of this. And so it's not only the immense bureaucracy that Donald Trump, it's key people in positions of power, which actually is such a great lesson for us in democracy, how important the people who occupy certain spaces right. are in preserving our democracy. And I'll also add one thing to the Hitler analogy. It wasn't just the American media. The German media never took him seriously. They were like, oh, he's kind of a joke. If you go back and look at it, oh, he's kind of a joke. He'll be OK. We have this system in place. There's no worries about it. And then in the aftermath, where, where he was elected, he was legitimately elected. Then you had people who were had served in power and said, we're going to give him these positions because we can control him. That was basically their stance. We'll give him these things because he'll be able to be controlled by us, and that'll be a good thing, and we'll be able to hold power. And look what happened. Right, exactly. Ditto Maduro uh, in, in Argentina, D D um, Bolsonaro in Brazil, same thing. They're treated as a joke. They're kind of funny. They're kind of glib. And you're like, they're really not a problem. They're sort of entertaining. I want to read you a line from a Washington Post piece, because I think the other piece of it is that the people on the ground don't fear the consequences of this kind of leadership. The Washington mm -hmm. Post quoted a, a, a voter named Orlando Monk. Um, and he's from Wisconsin, which is one of the tiny number of swing states that will decide the election. He says if it's between them, meaning Biden and Trump, I'm going to say this. Trump was hilarious. He was hilarious, said Monk, 43, who lives in the Milwaukee area. Biden, meanwhile, has not delivered the change he expected, leaving Monk unsure. I would say it's kind of up in the air. Michael Beschloss, this is the challenge. Joe Biden is slowed down by politics and bureaucracy, by the slowing right. mechanisms in the United States Senate, which means you need 60 votes to get things. People don't understand that minutia. They just know he can't get what he wants, whereas... Uh, Trump says, I'm going to ban all Muslims. He banned all Muslims. Trump says, I'm going to build a wall. He pretends I built a wall. Trump says, right, I'm going to rip babies away from their mothers if they try to come over this border. Stephen Miller says that. And suddenly babies are being ripped out of their mother's hands at the border. His autocracy is efficient. And so for a lot of people, they're like, I'd rather have that. And he's funny. No, that's right. And I'm hoping against hope that by 11 months from now, even Mr. Monk and other people who were saying things like this will understand that the choice of November 2024 is most likely going to be between democracy as flawed and faltering as it is and dictatorship autocracy that are going to take our rights away. Look at the reaction of women and men to the cancellation of Roe v. Wade. That's yes. what happens in the best of America when you take freedom away. We can hope that that is what's going to happen. But, you know, I shudder to think that after all the decades that our American soldiers fought fascism in Italy, Nazism in Germany, Imperial Japan, Soviet dictatorship for 
46 years, we're going to throw all of this away so gingerly. I can't bring myself to believe that that's going to happen. Right. And I think you, people should remember when you're speaking of abortion, one of the first things that these guys uh, do and threaten to do is take away the rights of women, because controlling Absolutely. women is always part Absolutely. of the plan. And they banning right. abortion is always a part of it. You're right. It's a Instantly. signal. Um, and, you know, to go back, Matthew, to the to, to the, the minutia part, because I think this is the thing is I, I say this all the time to my poor beleaguered team. How do elections happen? Elections don't happen because there's some, you know, giant, you know, machine that turns on and elections happen. They happen because individual people at the bureaucratic level in the states begin the process. It's an honor system. They just believe there's supposed to be an election. And so they begin the process. What if they don't? Let me put up a map. These are the 19 states where 25 election, election deniers hold statewide positions with election oversight power. In other words, if they believe that Donald Trump cannot be returned to office by an election and they just say, you know what, we ain't doing it. Trump's in. We like him. We don't want him to be replaced. He stays. Who's going to, who's going to stop that? Nobody. Who's well, going to stop it? That's that's been the, the most nefarious. Um, one of the most nefarious part of this is the attack on our election infrastructure. The right. people that are the secretary of state in Michigan and in Wisconsin and in 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 Illinois and over that have been physically, physically and violently threatened in the course of this. Not only them, but local people that actually volunteer to serve at the polls. And th so you put those states up where you have election deniers in office, and then you overlap that where states where all these massive amount of threats that have occurred, where it's become difficult to recruit people to actually man the polls. And this is a recipe, as Michael, said, as Michael has alluded to or said, this is a recipe for not only an infrastructure in Washington, D.C., but a threatened infrastructure in the country that actually holds the elections done by little old men and women around the country who do, do, do they want to be visited by MAGA people at their home and threatened by the point of a gun in the course of this, which is what has happened. You saw what happened in Georgia in the course of this, people that are just trying to do their service and fulfill a civic duty. Those people are now under threat. And now they have to ask themselves, I love America. I believe in America. Do I want to put myself and my family at risk just to hold an election? Yeah, there used to be a, a, a senator from the United, from the state of Mississippi who used to say the best way to keep a black person, he didn't say black person, from voting is to visit them the night before with a gun. Uh, Michael, let's talk about the other things, because there are some fundamental anti-democratic aspects to our structure of our elections that also work against democracy and work for Trump. He only right. has to really carry a majority, 50.1, you know, 50 plus one in 10 states, basically, because, right. Right. you know, because of the Electoral College, it's gone down from 26 states that used to really be swing states and matter to like 10. You know, neither party will probably contest Florida this time. It's now seen as deep red like Alabama. So you're talking about maybe 10 states that decide who wins. The rest of the country is just stuck with the result. No, that's exactly right. And a system, and I loved what Matt said. I agree with everything he said. You know, go on to take a look. We have Citizens United. We have corporate and private money pouring into the system in a way that you can't imagine. That is, that is not progressive money for the most part. Those are people who would be perfectly content to accustom themselves to a Donald Trump dictatorship. If it comes to that, they're already showing that they are. And the other thing, Joy and Matt, you know, take a look at, you know, we have thought in the past that when Americans were confronted with the loss of our liberties, you know, that would be a, a deal breaker. It doesn't seem to be yet. And we're on the verge of a situation. You know, look right now, Donald Trump, I mean, I'll ask both of you, why is Donald Trump in public saying, I will be a dictator from day <laughs> one and presumably afterwards? I will use the Defense Department in a way that hasn't been done before. I'm going to talk about terminating the Constitution. I would expect, you know, Matt has this, you know, history as a campaign genius uh, of knowing that usually you'd expect a candidate who intends to do those things, not <laughs> telling you until Election Day, this is the beginning of the intimidation that we're talking about. Well, I think the well, reason yeah, he's I, making these threats is to get people to be quiet and to knuckle under even 11 months before his possible election. Please, everyone who's watching, all of our friends, beware. There are dire new warnings today from United Nations officials that the humanitarian efforts in Gaza are on the brink of total collapse. 
as fighting intensifies in the South. The U.N. agency on the ground there says the strip is now reaching a point of no return, while the humanitarian chief says plans for relief are in tatters and that, quote, we do not have a humanitarian operation in southern Gaza that can be called by that name anymore. The U.N. secretary general is also sounding the alarm, warning of a complete breakdown in public order. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is calling out Israel for not doing more to reduce civilian casualties, saying there's a gap between the intent to protect civilians and the actual results that we're seeing on the ground. This comes as over the past day, videos and images have been circulating, showing dozens of Palestinian men kneeling on the street, stripped to their underwear and blindfolded while being detained by Israeli soldiers. In one photo shared on social media, a group of men can be seen wearing what appears to be nothing but underwear as they kneel in a line, surrounded by armed soldiers in full combat gear. NBC News has not independently verified when these videos and images were taken. Joining me now is Hani al Madum, Director of Philanthropy at the United Nations Relief and Work Agency. It's good to see you, Hani. Um, and I'm glad that you were able to come on. Uh, I know you've been through a lot and lost a lot in this war, and including many family members. Um, but we were alerted that perhaps someone in that group, and we're going to show that picture again, is a member of your family. Can you tell us if that is accurate, and if so, who he is? <laughs> Yeah, Joy, this is my little brother, my baby brother, Mahmoud. He is uh, 32 years old. He was taken from his home. He was playing with uh, his two daughters, Noor and Sham. And he is 100 percent and a full-time civilian. A lot of the people in the image there, they're family members. And they've also taken my nephew, that you see him in a different picture. And the only reason we know this is because the IDF released this footage to share and to show the world how to humiliate Palestinians. They are meant for domestic consumption, to show the Israelis that, hey, we're arresting Palestinians. Sadly, they're dubbing them as combatants. And this is just a sad, cruel joke, because none of the folks in this image have anything to, anything to do with fighting. They were taken from their homes with their spouses and daughters. They're sheltering, seeking uh, safety. And sadly, that's, you know, that's my little brother. And it's shocking because he's not involved in anything. He can't, you know, he can't run two meters, unfortunately, but they still dub him as a combatant. And it's sad because you feel violated. You know, this is your baby brother and you've been meeting with people high in our government here in the U.S. And somehow I feel like I failed him. Well, you certainly did not. You're doing your best to try to get the information out about what's happening there. Where where was your brother and your cousins and et cetera? What part of Gaza were they in? They were in northern Gaza in an area called Mashru or Beit Lahia, the Beit Lahia project. This is our the third home that my family have moved to. Our other home was destroyed an hour and a half before the truce that killed my younger brother Majid. May his soul rest in peace. Last time we spoke, I had three brothers, Joy. Now I have two. Yeah. I miss him. I try to send him messages in WhatsApp now and then, and I want to share location as we used to. And he's gone an hour and a half before the truce. The home is gone. Four-story buildings I co-own with him. My family is now homeless. They found shelter inside my great uncle's home. And even then, the troops came in looking for them and humiliated them in front of their families and their kids. And this is insane because this is like meant to humiliate the Palestinians. And somehow the Israelis are convincing themselves that buys them safety. I doubt that our history shows that this has ever worked. And I'm broken for my brother. He was put stripped in the cold. They put him in the beach for a few hours. They're after, you know, just uh, insulting them, taking pictures of them and mocking them to insult their manhood and showing their buddies and various Israeli telegram groups the images of those civilians. And it's unfortunate. It really is. Um, I, I want to read a, this is a, I'll read part of this statement um, from the, the IDF. They've said over the past day, IDF and ISA forces apprehended hundreds of wanted suspects throughout the Gaza Strip during combat in Shajaya, Jabalia, and Khan Yunis. IDF troops apprehended hundreds of terror suspects. These suspects were transported by two security forces in Israel for further questioning. Um, they are saying that the people that they are detaining are terrorist operatives and suspects. Um, what do you make of that? Uh, that's if they were really suspects. This, these people were released within 10 hours of their detention. If they had any 
grain of truth in that statement, those folks would not be released. I'm happy my family is released. The Israelis know these are not fighters. They've grabbed people as old as my dad, 72 years old, as young as, as, young as Omar, he's 13 years old. And it just feels like, what can we do about this? This is just really unfortunate because our family members are not involved in anything. I vouch for every single one of them, our neighbors, that particular area where they say Jabalia is. I know a lot of these young men, they're trying to make a living somehow. My, my nephew tried to go to Europe to find a better job. He almost drowned in the Mediterranean. His mom pushed him to come back to Gaza, and now she regrets that decision. Can you imagine Joy being my mom? She buried a child, yeah. took her a week to get to their bodies, and then now they round up her kid to a known place, and then they humiliated her husband, who's a teacher of 40 years. This is a bit much for our family, but yet we stand yeah. to tell their stories. Uh, and I cannot, I cannot imagine, and I'm so sorry, and uh, my deepest condolences to your mom. Yes, she and your family have been through a lot. Um, we just had uh, a U.N. vote uh, recently, again, uh, calling for a ceasefire. The United States vetoed it uh, in the Security Council. Uh, Great Britain abstained. What do you make of these votes in the United Nations, the efficacy of them, the point of them at this point, knowing that the United States will veto them regardless? Do you think there is a point to the, the continuation of the United Nations process, or do you think that it is effective in any way? You've heard the Secretary General call for Article Number 99, you know, because this is a desperate humanitarian situation. The organization I support and traveled the country to generate resources for is UNRWA is in a very desperate situation. They're running out of funds. They cannot safely deliver aid. If they have the fuel, it's a very chaotic operation. They're asking for a ceasefire, a durable one. They're asking for more aid, for funding. They're saying, you know, everything is collapsing, hospitals, you know, this is not sustainable. You know, this has been more than two months. Unfortunately, the case of politicians here in the U.S. looking at the Middle East and telling us, hey, we know what's good for you, despite the fact more than 17,000 Palestinians are dead, 7,000 children of whom are our children. It's just heartbreaking because it's just like these yeah. politicians here. And they love this country. I love America. But the politicians here have failed us and they have not heard our plight. And despite our effort, we try, we try, we try, but we feel we somehow overnight we are told we don't belong. Hani, um, uh, Hani Amadoun, um, you are always welcome here. Um, we appreciate your willingness to talk about so many things that are personally painful for you and your family and the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Of course.